Hi, and welcome to another week of English Linguistics 317. This week, we are going to be starting on Old English, and you have new readings um, for this, so please continue reading your textbook. And just as a reminder, I have sent you a soft copy of the textbook. Uh, it should be in your mailbox. If you haven't received it by any means, send me an email because um, it's been a couple of weeks since I sent it out. So I just wanted to make sure that all of you have received the textbook and you've been uh, reading it. So in uh, last week, we uh, kind of talked about Indo-European um, and we looked at how linguistic reconstruction is a really good way of finding similarities and dissimilarities between languages. And we can create language families on the basis of uh, linguistic reconstruction. We also saw that English is an Indo-European language. It belongs to the West Germanic branch of Indo-European. And now this uh, video, we are actually going to be looking at Old English and the period of Old English really um, spans about uh, 500, 600 years or so. So it starts about roughly 449 AD and it ends at about 1180 with the Norman conquest. So here is a map of the British island. This is uh, from around um, 8400. And Kind of to give you a history of where England was at 400, I've been talking to you about it in a couple of different videos um, in this class, but uh, remember we were talking about how the Celtic people occupied uh, the British islands. Now, it was around um, 8443 that the Roman occupation began in uh, England. So uh, the Celtic people are kind of like the indigenous people of England. They existed before uh, the colonization or the invasion uh, of Rome happened. And then the Roman occupation uh, began in 8043 under the leadership of Emperor uh, Claudius. Now, here is a map of Roman Britain. And again, uh, you are most welcome to kind of enlarge this, uh, pause the video, enlarge it, um, and view the map. Uh, but really, I mean, it, you know, it, this is how Roman Britain looked like uh, in uh, 400 AD uh, before the invasion of the Germanic uh, tribes. So, the Germanic tribe, so that's really what we call as the English people, again, to kind of remind you, English did not originate in England. It came as a language from the uh, European subcontinent into uh, England, and that was around 5th century, so that was uh, 400 uh, AD. Uh, and it was in 410 AD that the Romans withdrew from Britain. So starting from 55 AD to 410 AD, uh, England was under a Roman invasion, right? So the Celtic people and the Roman people kind of survived together. And then the Romans withdrew from Britain in 410 AD. And this was the time that the Germanic tribes kind of invaded Britain. So who were the Germanic tribes? These were the Picts from the north, um, the Scots from the west, um, and uh, the Saxons, uh, which who were the Germanic uh, sea raiders. So here is a map of Roman Britain uh, in about 410 AD, um, and the the map of Britain uh, in the sense England is in the yellow. Um, whatever is not England at the top is Scotland. Um, and so you can see that the uh, the Picts and the Scots, they came from this area, right? So that's Germany. And so they crossed from here into England, right? And uh, uh, the Picts and the Scots and the uh, Anglo-Saxons, uh, they invaded uh, Roman Britain and Roman the, the Roman invaders left Britain um, around the same time. So the Saxons arrived in 449 AD, and that is really what uh, scholars across the world acknowledge as the beginning of the Old English era. Now, the term England is actually derived from uh, Anglo-Saxon, right? The land of the Angles, Angli meaning Engle, right? Angle, English. So the land of the Angles is called as England. And the, the invaders uh, from, um, the, uh, the Picts and Scots and the Anglo-Saxons, they came from Northern Germany as well as Southern Jutland. And the tribes were the Jutes, the Saxons and the Frisians, right? So 
there, there was the Jutes, the Saxon, the Frisians, there were the Anglo-Saxon, the Picts, the Scots, right? So many, many Germanic tribes that came and invaded uh, England in 449 AD really marks the arrival of English and the start of the Old English era. Now, the language that was spoken was uh, similar to Germanic, and there were different dialects of Germanic. So here is continental Germany, and this is uh, very often the first home of England, right, before England, uh, before they actually invaded um, England. So here is Jutland. So J, that's Jutland. This is Angles, right, or English. And then this is the Frisians right here, the Danes right here, right? Um, so, so you can see that these are all the uh, Germanic tribes that invaded England from uh, mainland Europe or continental Germany. Now, remember that I said that the Celtic people who inhabited England and the Roman invaders, they were really, um, uh, you know, they could live side by side, uh, they coexisted. But the Germanic sea raiders, all these Picts and Jutes and uh, Saxons and Frisians, uh, they actually did not, they were not so merciful. So the Celtic people actually quite suffered under the Germanic sea raiders, right? So it was not a very uh, peaceful kind of invasion, unlike the Roman invasion uh, of Britain. And in sixth century, this was the time that uh, St. Augustine reached the islands. And by then, the sea raiders had dominated the islands. So here, here we see the, uh, the Jutes arriving under the leadership of the brothers Hengist and Horsa. They are the great grandsons of Woden. And the Jutes settled in Kent. The Saxons settled in south of Thames River, and the Angles settled from Thames northward to the Scottish Islands. So you can see that each of the Germanic tribes kind of settled in a different place in within the English um, uh, with, within England. So they kind of had different territories. They kind of uh, set up different kingdoms, um, and the Jutes in Kent, Saxons south of Thames, and Angles northward to the Scottish Highlands. So here is a map kind of showing you the exact migration of Germanic uh, tribes. So this is Jutland. Uh, so these are the Jutes. The Jutes moved from Jutland all the way to Kent, right here. That's Kent. The Angles from Anglen, uh, they moved here, right, um, uh, to Northumbria, as well as to Mercia right here. And then Frisians, that's like not like right here, north of Saxony, Frisian islands. The Frisians moved from uh, here to, okay, so they're just showing you, yeah, they, they're not really showing you the migration of Frisian, but they're showing you the migration of Saxons. So Saxons right here, from here all the way to Thames, right? So the Thames River, this is kind of uh, what determines where London is, right? So London is on the banks of the Thames. So below that is Kent, right? And above that is Mercia and Northumbria, right? So Angles had the majority uh, of this portion. And that's what, one of the reasons why um, English uh, kind of flourished as a language um, uh, during the migration of the Germanic tribes. Okay, so here is a map of England in 550. So Jutes in Kent, East Angles, right? So Angles all the way here, right? All this portion, Angles. And then you have the Saxons right here, the Jutes right here, the Scots right here, and the Picts right here, right? As you can see, majority of the British islands were uh, settled by the um, uh, the Angles and then a little bit of the southern side by the Saxons. And that's why it's called the Anglo-Saxon settlement. The Anglo-Saxon settlement comprised of seven different kingdoms and together they were called as the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy. And these kingdoms were Kent, Essex, Wessex, Sussex, 
East Anglia, Mercia, and Northumbria. Northumbria is, is, is actually a conglomeration of two kingdoms, Bernicia and uh, Dera. So here is the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy. This is England around 680 uh, after the entire Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy was formed. So here is Bernicia and Terra together forming Northumbria. Here is Mercia. Here is uh, Anglia, East Anglia, right? And uh, here is um, South Saxon, West Saxon, right? So. Uh, you have Kent, so that's south, so that's right here, South Saxon, and then you have Essex, Wessex, and Sussex. So Essex is east, Wessex is west, and uh, Sussex is south. So east, Essex, Wessex, and Sussex, right? And then East Anglia, East Anglia, right here, Mercia, right here, and then Northumbria, uh, together with Bernicia and Dyra. Now, Kent and Northumbria, um, so Kent was actually flourishing under the leadership of King Ethelbert. And after Kent, the kind of uh, prominent uh, supremacy uh, among the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy went to uh, the kingdom of Northumbria, uh, because again, Northumbria was divided into Bernicia and Daira, and they also had, uh, a lot of centers of learning, such as Lindisfarne, Vermouth, and Jarrow. And these were all uh, popular centers of learning uh, because there were a lot of uh, literature that flourished in, this, in these areas, etc. So from Kent, which was like all the way south, uh, the kind of supremacy went to the north uh, for Northumbria. And then from there, it went to Mercia, and finally, uh, Wessex under the leadership of King Egbert, whose grandson was Alfred uh, the Great, who was also given the uh, title as Rex Angelorum, uh, King of the English. Rex being uh, King for Latin and Angelorum, um, England. So uh, I kind of talked to you about how St. Augustine came uh, to the British Islands about uh, 680. Uh, and he was actually the first Archbishop of Canterbury, right? And, uh, you know, you're most familiar with like Canterbury tales. Um, and this was the time that the first Church of England was established in um, 680. Uh, and he became the first Archbishop of that uh, church. And he arrived with his band of missionaries to uh, Kent, to an island uh, in uh, Kent. Now, so remember that there was already the Celtic church with the Irish missionaries that existed in England. And then the Roman Catholic church uh, with uh, St. Augustine. And there was also the Irish missionaries and the Irish church. So there was all these kind of Catholicism or different bands of Catholicism that was being practiced at England. Um, and Christianity as a religion was introduced to the British islands before the year uh, 500, before 8500, uh, sorry, before 8400 or start of old English because of the Roman invasion. But now, England had to kind of decide which uh, branch of Christianity it would practice, right? Because there was Roman Catholicism, there was Celtic Church, as well as uh, the Irish Catholicism. So there was a lot of conversion that happened in Northumbria and Mercia. And like I said, these were the areas of learning. These were the centers of learning. So there was a lot of kind of push uh, for Irish Catholicism at that point. Um, and the Irish missionaries also introduced their form of writing to the English, and this kind of writing was called as the insular hand. So this was a writing script that the Irish missionaries gave uh, to the people of England. Now, like I said, the, the English, um, uh, the England had to kind of decide whether it would follow Roman Catholicism or Irish Catholicism. And there was a sign nod that was held at this place called Whitby in 664. Um, and the sign nod actually gave uh, preference to Roman Catholicism. And that is when it was around 680 when England kind of aligned or the English church kind of aligned with Roman uh, Catholicism um, and kind of started moving away from Irish Catholicism and the Irish church. 
Now let's talk about uh, literature and um, one of the first textbooks, one of the first books that was written in Old English was written by the Venerable Bede. He was a saint uh, that lived in the seventh century. And the book that he wrote was called as the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, Historia Ecclesiastica Hens Angelorum. Um, and this was written in Latin and completed in around um, AD 730. So here is Venerable Bede with writing his uh, ecclesiastical history. And here is a page of the ecclesiastical history. Um, I mean, you can again enlarge and read the text, but a lot of this is uh, kind of difficult uh, to read because obviously it's written in um, Latin. Um, and uh, very few people knew Latin at that point. Latin was kind of, um, it, it came because of the, of the connection to Roman Catholicism, right? Uh, but also the arrival of Latin as a language uh, is going to be much later on towards the Middle English uh, kind of era. So we will talk a lot more about that uh, when we get into the Middle English uh, period. So moving on in the history uh, from 8400 to 1100, now we're in 8th century, this was when the first Viking conquest happened. So now remember the Celtic people, Romans left uh, Britain. All the Germanic tribes had now invaded and set up kingdoms. And now in the eighth century, uh, there was another invasion by Viking uh, raiders. And this was in 865. Uh, and the, the, the first Viking raiders landed in East Anglia led by Ivar the Boneless and his brother Hafton. And they were both sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. And they possessed the whole Eastern part of England. So they set up kingdom in the Eastern uh, part of England. So here is a map of England in the eighth century. And so it, the Eastern part uh, would be like right here. So this is where the East Anglia is right here. So that's where the Vikings uh, settled in England. Now, uh, just to kind of give you a history of the Vikings, uh, and some of you might be more familiar with this history, having maybe done another class in history um, of the Vikings or having watched a couple of these kind of televised uh, series. So just to kind of give you a timeline, uh, moving up to Middle English. In 1870, the Vikings attacked Wessex. So they were in East Anglia, and they attacked Wessex. Uh, and Wessex was ruled by the first Ethelred and his brother Alfred at that point. And in 878, Alfred won at Eddington and defeated Guthrum, the Danish king of East Anglia, and the Vikings dominated Dane law, that is Northumbria and East Anglia. So here is a map of England in the 9th century. So you can see the kingdom of Bissax right here. Right? Um, you have Mercia, Northumbria right here, right? and the Dane law right here. So Mercia, Dane law right here, East Anglia, and all of the Sacks and Northumbria right here. And here is uh, Alfred the Great. We talked about Alfred the Great. This is a 19th century depiction of Alfred the Great. He is the only English king to be given the title of the Great, right? And Alfred the Great was not just a great leader and king, but he also translated a lot of Latin books into English. So he translated Pope Gregory the Great's Pastoral Care, Orosius's History, Bothius's Consolation of Philosophy, and St. Augustine's Soliloquies, as well as Bede's Ecclesiastical History and the Anglo-Saxon uh, Chronicle. Now we come into the second Viking conquest, and this is in the 10th century, led by Olaf Tigwesen. So just to kind of give you a timeline, um, in 991, um, there was a Battle of Maldon. This is celebrated in an Old English poem. That's how we know about it. And in 1016, we see the deaths of Ethelred and his son, Edmund Ironside. Um, and Canute, who was the son of Swine Folkbeard, took over the thr throne. Now, Canute was succeeded by his sons, Harold Harefoot and Hardy Canute. And in 1042, 
the line of Alfred was restored when Edward the Confessor came into power, right? So briefly, the power went to the Vikings after the Viking Conquest 1 and 2, and then in 1042, uh, closer to the Middle English era, to, closer to the Norman Conquest, the line of Alfred was restored. Now, the Scandinavian languages were like Old English. So if you look at Beowulf, uh, Beowulf is written in Old English and it's really about this Viking uh, conquest and Scandinavian legend and history. So here is the opening page of Beowulf. And I know that many of you are familiar with Beowulf and you might have even um, read Beowulf in another uh, class of yours, especially if you're taking uh, literature uh, courses at WSU. And I'm kind of uh, running through the history really because I'm not really going to talk about the history of England because what I'm interested in is in the history of the English language. So that's really why, you know, uh, you know, if you're really interested in the history, uh, you should, you know, kind of read up more. Uh, there's a lot more in the textbook as well as all these televised kind of series that you can watch um, with, with for the Scandinavian, uh, you know, Viking conquest. Now, Scandinavians or the Vikings and the English had a very amicable relationship. The Danish people settled down with English and there were also a lot of common words such as man, wife, mother, folk, house, thing, and winter. And these were common uh, kind of origin between Old English and Old um, Norse. Now, this was also the period, uh, the golden age of Old English. Uh, especially because there was a lot of uh, kind of literature, there was a lot of learning uh, centers, such as monasteries at Canterbury, Glastonbury, Bermuth, Lindisfarne, Jarrow, York, etc. Um, the the Benedict uh, Bishop, uh, Venerable Bede, etc. Uh, were really great scholars uh, working at these monasteries. Uh, um, you know, kind of uh, flourishing uh, with respect to uh, literature. Um, and that's why it's called as golden age of old English. There was also the cathedral school at York that provided Charles the Great with leadership and also Alcuin introduced the tradition of Anglo-Saxon humanism to Western Europe. This was also the period uh, when literature really flourished, poetry really flourished. Uh, Cadman was the first English poet. Uh, he was a seventh century herdsman. And there was also the epic uh, poem, uh, Beowulf. With respect to uh, prose, Alfric was one of the Benedictine monks who was a very important pro stylist of classical Old English. And this was in 10th and early 11th century. And he wrote the first vernacular grammar of Latin, uh, which was kind of a humorous colloquy about uh, Anglo-Saxon occupations. Now, when you look at dialects of Old English, uh, there were actually four main dialects of Anglo-Saxon England. And these were uh, Kentish, spoken by uh, the Jude uh, settlers. Then there was West Saxon. This was south of the Thames, exclusive of Ten Kent. Mercian, spoken from the Thames to the Humber, exclusive of Wales, and Northumbrian, uh, which was north of Humber. And then Mercian and Northumbrian together were called as Anglian, uh, because these were spoke th those who spoke um, Angles became known as Anglian. So you had Kentish, you had West Saxon, Mercian, Northumbrian, and then you had Anglian. The West Saxon dialect is going to be really important because um, West Saxon dialect, uh, it, the, the standard modern English is a descendant of West Saxon dialect, uh, also Mercian speech. So it's a combination of Mercian speech and West uh, Saxon dialect. And that is what we are going to be looking at in um, the next video when we are looking at the sound system um, of Old English. So here is a map of the dialects of Old English. So you have, um, again, Northumbria, Mercia, London right here, Kent and the Sax. And you can see, so Kentish uh, spoken right here, that's Kentish. You have West Saxon spoken right here. Mercian spoken from Thames to Humber, so from here to here. And then you have Northumbrian, which is spoken right here. So Old English that we are going to be concerned with um, is going to 
be the the English that kind of started at 80,000 because we've been talking about old English period from like say 480 all the way up to 1180 and the old English that we are going to be concerned with will be from the the, the old English starting uh, at 1080. And what we know about this is preserved in manuscripts in late West Saxon uh, or classical Old English. And it covers a period of six centuries, uh, so a period of about 600 years. Now I'm going to be ending with uh, some photos of Sutton Hoo, some um, excavations that happened in Sutton Hoo. Um, so here are some pictures of Sutton Hoo. I'm just going to be showing this to you um, because this is really um, what we know about Old English and what we know about the 600 years, this is Sutton who kind of contributed a lot to our knowledge of Old English and that era, right? So here is Sutton who, right here. And here are some excavated items. These can be found in uh, museums in London. And again, this is you know, an, an entire boat that was intact in Sutton Hoo that is excavated. All right, so that's the end of Old English and I will see you in the next video where we talk about the sounds of Old English.